now we'll introduce um, Mathieu Lecon, uh, otherwise known as Matt. And Matt is a conservation technologist at Thousand Islands National Park. And he's been there for four years. And last year he started coordinating rare, the rare program. And that means the rare animals that are in this area, the turtles, the frogs, the gray rat snakes. And um, he does a lot of, um, well, playing mother, really. He incubates turtle eggs this time of year and uh, things like that. So it's quite fun. He'll tell you more about that. He's originally from Kingston and he went to the University of Guelph and um, he worked in Toronto for a time before he came here to live in the GMA, the Greater Mallory Town area. So um, welcome, Matt. And um, I know we're going to really enjoy the chat. Um, and I'm just now going to, for myself, going to go to uh, uh, see the uh, just just to try and make my screen as small so I can see you most of all and your talk. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great. Thanks a lot, Marnie. Uh, yeah, it's great uh, to have this talk with you all. And uh, yeah, I hope they can see all your faces and chat at the end. But yeah, like Marnie said, I'm uh, Matt LeCompte from Parks Canada, working here at Thousand Islands National Park. And the last, uh, year and a little bit. I've got to work exclusively uh, with reptiles and amphibians in the area, including turtles. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about that today, about the turtles that are in our area, uh, the threats that they face, things that the park is doing to help, and uh, ways that you could help as well. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, hosting me on this chat. And it's a, it's a timely talk as we're coming into turtle season. Uh, now, as I say, uh, you'll be seeing turtles more on the road now if you haven't already. And we'll be seeing turtles nesting shortly uh, too. So I'll just uh, share my screen here and start the presentation. And you could throw questions in the chat as we go, and uh, I'll I'll get to those um, at the end of the presentation. All right, so I'm presenting now, Marnie. Let me know if uh, things are not working out. I'm just going to go back, turn my camera off for bandwidth. All right. Okay, I will let you know. And I'm muted myself and I don't have my video on. So here we all Great. go. Yeah, looking good here. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is uh, all about turtles today and the other reptiles and amphibians in the area. Rare, a uh, bit of a mouthful, but stands for reptile and amphibian recovery and education. It's a special project that the park has uh, started in 2019 along with other national parks uh, in Ontario to help reptiles and amphibians uh, in the area. And before I jump in, I'd like to acknowledge that the Thousand Islands National Park and region is situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. And this region was and remains an important homeland with cultural and spiritual significance to the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. And this is uh, highlighted by the importance of turtles as we talk about today. And uh, like I told Marnie before, we do have another presentation that highlights that cultural significance on YouTube called For the Love of Turtles. Um, if you want to learn more about that um, aspect of turtles. Um, and to, to hop into it, uh, we'll talk about why this area uh, is so important for turtles and for all species and really what makes it special. Um, so as you know, the front neck or the park is located along the St. Lawrence River, uh, ranging from Kingston to Brockville, um, and it's located within the front neck arch. And so this is the link between the Canadian Shield and the Adirondacks in the in the US. And it's such an important ecological crossroads and a continental pinch point. Um, that is so important for species movement um, and 
just a, a, an amazing corridor for, for species. And within this area um, that we are, the Frontenac Arch, um, we see a mixture of species that um, are at both the southern portion of the range, like from the north of the province, and then species that are at the, their northernmost range, so that are primarily found in the U.S., but um, are just able to survive um, in our area. And that's because um, the St. Lawrence River and the topography of the area cre creates these unique uh, habitats where species can't really survive uh, elsewhere in Ontario or even Canada. Um, and this is why the Thousand Islands National Park in the region boasts one of the highest biodiversities in Canada. Uh, one of the top three biodiversities of all national parks in Canada. And this includes uh, nearly 50 species at risk. Um, and we can't talk about species at risk without mentioning the reptiles and amphibians. Um, this area was declared a nationally important uh, amphibian and reptile area by the Canadian Herpetolo Herpetological Society in 2020, recognizing uh, this biodiversity. And our region and Southern Ontario really is a hot spot uh, for herptiles, which are reptiles and amphibians. And it's an easier way of saying that. And yeah, we are so lucky to live in this area that's so rich uh, with, these, with these species. And here are some of these species. Um, this is why, partly why the area was uh, named such an important area by that soci society. Um, the area is home to 10 species of snakes and uh, uh, one lizard species. Uh, we have the five species of turtles, which are all species at risk. Uh, there's 10 species of frogs and toads, six species of salamanders, and 10 of these 31 species are actually species at risk. Um, and this uh, area provides the habitat for this range of species. Um, there's vernal pools for amphibians like the western chorus frog that you see here. Um, there is rocky barrens for Ontario's only lizard species, the five-lined skink uh, that you see here. Um, we have tur amazing turtles like the northern map turtle stacked up here. And we have the threatened gray rat snake. Um, this really only occurs in one other part of Canada. And here in our region is the largest population in Canada. Uh, it's one of Canada's largest snakes. It's uh, the longest. Uh, reaching up to 2.5 meters. And yeah, it's such a, a special snake. And altogether, this really shows what a special area this is uh, for reptiles and amphibians. It really can provide those different habitats uh, where they can all um, survive. And what makes all these things similar is that they're all uh, herptiles and they're all ectothermic meaning that they don't produce uh, enough heat on their own to control their temperatures internally. And instead, they rely on the environment around them to control their body temperature. Um, that's what makes them all similar. Uh, um, but today, uh, all these creatures are great, but we're going to talk more about the turtle species that are found here. And so uh, it says turtles in Thousand Islands National Park, but this includes uh, the whole watershed here, the whole area um, of turtles. And so this includes, we have the uh, northern map turtle, um, the eastern musk turtle, the stink pot, uh, the midland painted turtle, the snapping turtle, and the blandings turtle. And all five of these species are species at risk. And there's eight total species of turtles in Ontario, and all are at risk. Uh, including these ones here. And a couple quick points to ID if you see these guys. We'll start on the right. The Blanding's turtle has that big domed shell around it. And the most distinctive feature is that yellow throat um, that's hard to miss. And if you see that yellow throat, you know you've seen a Blanding's. And they are uh, the most at risk turtle in this area, in the Thousand Islands. They are endangered uh, recently upgraded to that status uh, in the past year. Uh, the snapping turtle, most people are probably familiar with, uh, Canada's largest freshwater turtle. Uh, one of the, it's the only turtle that can't fully retract its head into its shell. So uh, might be why it's a bit more um, defensive uh, when approached. It can't kind of hide away like these other turtles. 
uh, very dinosaur looking turtle. The painted turtle loves swimming, basking on logs, has that amazing red uh, through its shell and, and yellow uh, into the neck. You might think it's a bit more of a, of a common turtle, but it has been listed federally as a special concern species at risk. The Eastern musk is uh, the smallest turtle in Ontario. You might not have seen this one. It's more of a secretive turtle that likes hanging out in shallow waters. And yeah, like I said, it's uh, nicknamed the stink pot for its musking ability uh, as a defense mechanism to, to get a little stinky um, as a defense. And then the Northern map turtle that you saw the photo of uh, in the previous slide, uh, these turtles just love fresh open water. Uh, they are a larger turtle uh, compared to some of these others, uh, not as big as a snapping turtle. Uh, and they have a ridge right in the middle of their shell and then uh, the lines through them make them look like a map giving them that name. So that's kind of a snapshot of all the turtles that you could find in the Thousand Islands and within the park. Um, and yeah, they're all needing uh, help. They're all species at risk, um, all these five turtles. and so why is it that these turtles are at risk? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Um, so all turtle species in Ontario, like those five are at risk. And the most uh, significant impact uh, to that is habitat loss. So in Canada uh, and in Southern Ontario, we've seen the majority of the aquatic habitats or um, wetland areas uh, gone for, for what, agriculture or development for, for cities, uh, urban development. We've seen uh, the habitat loss as one of the main contributors of all Ontario's species being listed as species at risk. And with this habitat loss, there's also been some habitat that has become worse with things like uh, invasive species. So if you've seen Phragmites around, those tall, uh, looking reeds, well, those uh, grow really densely and they can uh, take away habitat that turtles use in the marsh. And so habitat is lost, it can be degraded, but it's also fragmented. So uh, we see roads that divide through uh, wetlands and uh, this is a big threat to turtles as well as since uh, many turtles are, are simply hit by cars. And if we think about the Thousand Islands area, uh, roads pose a large risk to, to all reptiles and amphibians. So we have east-west roads like the Thousand Islands Parkway, uh, the Mighty 401, we have Highway 2 and also some rail lines. Um, so all these uh, pose a big threat to turtles as they move. Uh, they're looking for mates, they're looking for areas to lay their eggs. And obviously, um, turtles are slow moving and they don't really stand a chance uh, against fast moving vehicles. Uh, and we, uh, we see uh, more vehicles in this area uh, throughout the summer and when, when turtles start to become more active as the area gets busier uh, along with the turtles. Um, so even if turtles are able to get to their nesting spot or wherever they're looking to go and uh, avoid all the dangers of the roadway, the challenge is not over for them uh, as they face nest predators. So nest uh, predators eat the eggs of, uh, from turtle nest uh, shortly after they're laid or a, a bit after. And while this can be a natural part of the food chain for mammals like uh, skunks, foxes, or raccoons, we have human subsidized predators uh, that have really big impacts on the populations of turtles. And these subsidized predators are um, populations of species like raccoons, skunks, or foxes, like I say, that have become kind of artificially inflated uh, due to residential or agricultural waste. And so these have a larger impact than they really, really naturally would. And they can destroy like up to 100% of turtle nests in, in some areas and lead to uh, no hatchlings being born um, in specific areas where, where they are an issue. And so those three, I'd say, are some of the larger, uh, biggest impacts uh, to creating the, these turtles as at risk. 
Uh, but we also have things like illegal, collect illegal collection. So poaching, people taking turtles um, can be an issue. Uh, obviously, boating in this issue is very po uh, boating in this region is very popular. So uh, turtles being aquatic can be struck by boats. Uh, they can also be caught um, while fishing, whether recreationally or or commercially. So um, all these all these threats are really what turtles face. Uh, and has made them at risk. And you can see a really big snapping turtle here crossing a road looking for a place to nest. Uh, and so turtles are really a slow reptile in a really fast world now. So while all these threats exist, it's really compounded by the way that they grow up and that they live. So they grow up really slowly and uh, they have low rates for reproduction that take a long time. So even if that uh, female turtle is able to make it to the nesting site and successfully deposit the eggs, um, yeah, those offspring might only have a 1% chance of reaching maturity, so the ability to lay eggs again for the next generation. Um, so most turtles will have to nest sev for several years or even decades before it can replace itself in the population. Um, so that's why adult turtles are so important. So the turtle, like you see here, the Blanding's turtle, it can take up to 25 years before it's actually able to, to lay eggs um, at maturity uh, and create new hatchlings. And uh, snapping turtles, uh, not quite as long, but up to 20 years, 18 years to lay the next generation. Then they're faced with the nest predators um, and other risks. So by the time, that turtle can uh, lay the next generation, it can take up to 60 years for one adult to replace itself in the population. So that's why adults are so uh, important for turtles. They um, lay the, the offspring and they're essential to keep turtle populations from declining. And it's really, um, really uh, bad when those turtles are hit along the roadway because uh, they take so long to mature and, um, but once they reach that maturity, that's when they're most important because they can live for so long. Uh, some species can live over 100 years. Um, and yeah, this, this life history compounds those threats uh, that they face. And yeah, it makes you think, it makes me think about and more motivated to help turtles on roadways when you think um, that a turtle can be over 25 years old or up to 80 years old. Um, and they're looking to lay uh, the next generation and they've survived so much. Um, so it's really a, a motivation for me to, to help them along the roadways. And so, yeah, turtles are at risk. Um, we know why now, but why do we care? Um, well, there's great benefits um, of maintaining biodiversity of the region, uh, of course, but turtles are also a really important keystone species who have an important role in the food web um, to, to provide uh, ecosystem services and to help other species um, and the whole ecosystem as a whole. Um, so turtles, they've been they've been called uh, I've heard as the custodians of the wetland. So when it comes to turtles, they're essential. Uh, in maintaining things like water quality, they're able to remove um, sources of harmful bacteria from the water. Uh, these turtles eat fish and animals that die in lakes and wetlands. Um, so they eat those things that are dying within our waterways. They also feed on crayfish, insects, fish, frogs, and plants. And by doing this, they're essential in keeping fish and wetland areas thriving. And Turtles can actually help promote wetland growth and biodiversity. So they cycle nutrients in their guts and then their shells, um, and they can actually uh, disperse these seeds and spread and encourage new life uh, within the wetland. And we and we have to acknowledge uh, turtles have been around for for so long um, that we really have a responsibility to to keep them thriving. And while they are really important for wetlands. We also should acknowledge how important wetlands are for turtles. So they support their uh, hibernation areas, areas where they meet their mates, uh, areas where they regulate their body temperatures, where they look for food, and where they can hide from predators. 
um, such as the Jones Creek wetland, uh, which is in our area here. You can see here um, a really important area for turtles uh, to do all these things. And so based on these threats, um, I'll talk about some of the things that the Thousand Islands National Park has been doing through the RARE program um, to help turtles and other reptile and amphibians in our area. So some of these things that I'll talk about, just give a preview here, are turtle nest protectors, uh, nest, nesting site creation, uh, egg, incub egg incubation. We've also focused on education and outreach to the community. And we're exploring areas for eco passage and fencing to, to help turtles avoid road mortality. So the first thing I'll just talk about is an artificial nesting site. So we've made, we've created one of these uh, alongside one of our wetlands in the park. And this is constructed to provide uh, an alternative place for turtles to nest. Uh, this is because turtles love the gravel mix that are beside roads for nesting and they often cross roads to find suitable nesting sites. And this is because that gravel mix is well drained, it's loose and it has the ability to hold the right amount of moisture. So we've mimicked that in an artificial nesting site beside a wetland where turtles can nest away from dangerous roads. And now we'll talk about turtle egg incubation. So this is a program we've done since 2019 where uh, turtle eggs are collected uh, in areas that have less than a 1% chance of survival. So this is in areas uh, so far beside roadways where nest predation is a huge risk and road mortality uh, is a risk for hatchlings and for adults too. So the site you see here is beside a busy highway. And like I said, they love that gravel mixture beside the road, unfortunately, for their eggs, which uh, is dangerous to them. And so, yeah, the eggs are collected in the spring. So we're actually preparing uh, for to do that shortly. Uh, uh, you need to look out on the roads that haven't seen much activity yet. And then in the coming weeks, turtles will be looking to to lay their lay their eggs. And the main reason for incubating turtle eggs was to uh, increase the population of turtles within the park uh, by offsetting these threats, um, but also to provide a chance for education and outreach um, to help and inspire others to take action as well. And yeah, so that's uh, some of our staff here collecting the turtle eggs and uh, this is a sneak peek to a little snapping turtle hatching out of its shell there. And so how we do it, the eggs are collected uh, in the next week or two, I'd say. Uh, they're placed in one of our incubators. So an incubator uh, right here looks like a mini fridge. They keep eggs at a relatively constant temperature. And that is really important because um, really the two main things for maintaining eggs is temperature and moisture. And both of these things influence the length of incubation. Um, Although temperature uh, is important because it determines the, the sex of the, of the turtle. So uh, if it's uh, in, in the natural world, uh, if it's a cooler season, um, you would get uh, a higher percentage of male turtles. And if it was higher temperatures within their range, you'll see more female turtles. And our incubators are set um, kind of between that, which can produce a mixed uh, sex clutch uh, for the species that we collect. Uh, so yeah, we, bring, we collect them, we bring them into our incubator, we maintain the temperature, and we maintain the moisture within these containers because uh, the eggs of turtles can exchange water with the environment around them in their nests uh, in the real world and in our lab here. Um, so eggs in nests with moist soils can absorb water, while eggs in drier soils can lose water. So we want to maintain the right amount of moisture because uh, the amount of water during the incubation time affects their size, their body composition, um, and yeah, their, their chance at survival. And after about 60 to 90 days in the incubator uh, or in the natural world, hatchlings begin to emerge from their shell. And I'll highlight 
their cute little egg tooth. Um, so it's not really a great photo here, but right on their nose here is what they have is called an egg tooth. And this helps them break out of their shell. So turtles are born with a single tooth on their nose. Um, and this falls off shortly after hatching. And this is actually the only tooth the turtle has its whole life as uh, they don't have teeth. They rely on their powerful jaws or their claws to, to uh, chew and eat up food. So yeah, they're born with this cute little egg tooth and they break out of their shell uh, in, uh, after that uh, incubation period. Uh, another thing about turtle hatchlings, they're born with what's called a yolk sac, as you can see here. Uh, that's attached to their plastron or the bottom of their shell, which provides them all the high hydration or nutrients that they need to start their life. So they absorb that and it gives them kind of the food and water that they need uh, to start off uh, their life. So yeah, these are snapping turtles uh, absorbing their yolk sac and getting ready to be released. And that little yolk sac is really important because you could say the parents of baby turtles are not the most attentive. Uh, after the, the mother lays the eggs, she doesn't provide any further care. She doesn't look back. These guys uh, are on their own. And here they are starting their lives. We have a snapping turtle here and some painted turtles. And since uh, 2014, we've had over 400 turtles incubated and released back to the home wetland. So right beside where they were collected. And this includes the snapping turtle, painted turtles that you see here, and also the musk turtle, the stink pot. And this was all done under approved permitting and it helps localize areas uh, with species recovery. But it, like I said, it also provides a great educational opportunity. So we've had turtle release events with partners and local youth to help promote turtle conservation uh, within the community and help uh, get people involved uh, with turtles. And uh, it's changed a bit with COVID, but to, for example, in 2019, we had uh, almost 500 students from kindergarten to grade eight uh, that were reached through turtle talks, uh, like including these hatchling parties as we call them. Um, and some kids even got to, to name their own turtle and release it themselves. Uh, so that's an important part of the program as there's so many turtles in this area uh, and other species outside of the park boundaries. So outreach and education and uh, you folks too are so important uh, for the protection as we're just one small part of this area. And another big part of this project where some of you may be able to get involved is turtle nest protectors. So these simple boxes really can make a huge difference in protecting turtle eggs from those nest predators that I was talking about. So thousands of turtle eggs have been protected in the region already since 2019. Uh, over 150 nest boxes have been distributed uh, to people uh, to help protect turtle eggs. So these simply go over the, the nest after turtles have laid these eggs. Uh, they're secured down and Mammals like raccoons aren't able to dig them up and eat them. And uh, you see them in action here, ready for pickup in the middle. And then uh, these snapping turtles was a photo sent in by uh, a local resident who had uh, successful uh, turtle hatching uh, on their property um, and able to, uh, to see them emerge actually a very really lucky, uh, lucky person there. And, and so these actions are great um to help turtles recover and to help educate people and uh like i said we're we're also exploring other opportunities to to help protect turtles in the area with things like uh fencing or eco passages and yeah that brings me to the next the third portion of the presentation so ways that you can help and really there's lots of ways that uh people can help turtles uh in the area uh whether it's helping them across the road, protecting their nests, or just learning more and teaching others. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways I'll get into them now. Um, as you see one of our staff on the right here, helping a snapping turtle along, and you see a little painted turtle there uh, in the area. So we'll, I just wanna talk about uh, one way that was highlighted there is to help turtles across the road. So if you're driving, 
and you see a turtle in the roadway, uh, you could help it out. But you want to make sure, obviously, that you are safe on the roadway first. Uh, you don't want to put yourself in a dangerous situation. But if it is safe and you're able to help, you always want to move the turtle in the direction that it's going. If you bring it back, uh, so wherever its head's pointing, bring it that way. <laughs> if you turn it around, it is de a determined turtle. It will just end up going back and trying to cross the road again. So you won't be helping it out if you <laughs> bring it back the other way. So always in the direction that they are going. And as you can see here, this is a Blanding's turtle. Most turtles uh, in our area can be picked up with two hands, kind of like a, a sandwich hold, you could say. Uh, and you'll be safe to do so. And the turtle will be safe. You want to have a good grip. You don't want to drop the turtle. And you just carry it along to the other side of the road and release it. You don't want to handle it any more uh, than you have to. Uh, a special handling needs to be considered for snapping turtles. Uh, these are still lovely turtles that we don't need to be afraid of. But like I said, they have the long necks that they can't retract. And they can be a bit more defensive than other turtles when you approach them. And you, you only want to handle a snapping turtle if you're comfortable. Uh, if you are handling it and you drop it, you might be doing it more harm than, than, you, uh, than you're doing to help it. So yeah, only handle if comfortable. And the ways to do that is to put one hand at the back of the shell and one hand underneath, like you can see here. Um, but yeah, the snapping turtle can reach almost halfway back or halfway back to its shell. So yeah, you want to be very careful with that. One way I've seen is you can use a take out your car floor mat, grab it by the back of its shell, and put it on the mat and just drag it along um, to the other side of the road so you can get a bit creative uh, with that. And just to go back, you can see our staff doing that same hold there for kind of a mid sized snapper. Uh, if it's a smaller snapper, you can also just grab with two hands on the back of its shell. Um, but yes, you want to take extra caution with the snapping turtle. Um, and yeah, you never want to pick it up by its tail either. So you want a good grip uh, if you're comfortable to help a turtle along. And yeah, the last thing, or the second thing, um, different ways you can just be a friend to, to herptile. So uh, if you've heard of iNaturalist, it's a great way of reporting wildlife sightings to conservation groups to help find areas that need protection for turtles. Uh, like you're doing today, it's great to learn about species at risk in your in your area and teach others, kind of dispel any myths. So, although snappers uh, can be scary to some people, they're they're just uh, trying to protect themselves and they don't really deserve any persecution. Uh, if you have property where turtles are present, uh, you can help just maintain those wetlands, uh, keep a natural shoreline on your property that's inviting for turtles. And if you find an injured turtle, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center uh, can help. They can be found online and they can direct you to nearby uh, rehabbers in the region that can help turtles that are injured. And also, if you have turtles on your property, uh, you can use a turtle nest protecting box like I talked about today. Uh, so yeah, the, the park has these available uh to provide to local residents in the area uh, so if you know you have turtles on your property and you want to protect the nest uh reach out uh, to this email address uh and we will do our best uh to coordinate uh, a box for you and you can see a box in action here on one of our islands that help protect turtles uh turtle eggs And yeah, so we've gotten to the end here. And yeah, just another thank you for everyone joining me, uh, learning about these amazing turtles uh, and some of the other species that are in our area. Uh, and send me an email at this email below if you uh, want to learn anything else or have any questions. You can follow the park on its Facebook page for any up to the date events uh, that are happening in the park. Uh, and if you're in the area, we also have an exhibit at the Aquatarium in Brockville about turtles and snakes uh, coming in, the, coming live in a few weeks that will likely have so, some of our incubated turtles uh, that you can see too. 
Uh, so yeah, thank you so much all for, for joining me. And I think we can, we can turn our cameras on now if we'd like, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And everybody can turn on their audio and their camera. Um, so um, yeah, Just, uh, yep. And uh, if you have some questions and, and I don't know, Matt, can you see the chat there? Um, yeah. Ron has a couple of questions. How do you know where to find the nest to dig up the eggs to incubate? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's easiest if you if you actually can see the turtle doing doing the nest. Um, snappers are a bit more obvious, um, but turtles are quite good at covering up the areas and hiding where their nests are. Specifically, turtles like painted turtles, you really have no idea. Um, so you'd want to look for like those suitable areas, those gravelly areas um, and some disturbed gravel. Um, but really the easiest and the best way is to, to kind of know uh, where the turtles are and to see them nesting, which, which should be occurring uh, mm -hmm. anytime now and, and through June. Okay, y Yvonne also says uh, you can even use a stick to tap the snapper shell at the back and hurry them across the road. I did this once on Highway 2 and my husband stopped all the traffic. Yeah, yeah, any way to, to help them is uh, is helpful. Um, yeah, I just, this week I had a snapping turtle and it had almost crossed the road and I just walked behind it and it gave it a, a little burst of energy and it, it ran off the road. So yeah, you don't always have to, to handle them. Sometimes yeah. they're motivated <laughs> in other ways. And Yvonne also asks, are there any plans to create another turtle conservation and surgery unit like the OTCC in this area? The OTCC is a long way away. Yeah, it, it certainly isn't, isn't the closest to us, uh, but there is other area, uh, other, um, other uh, places that can help. Um, so uh, Sandy Pines Wildlife Center in Napanee does a lot of work with turtle rehab, and uh, I think the OTCC directs turtles there. Uh, there's also a place uh, in the Kempville area, Rito, Rito Valley Wildlife. I might be saying that wrong, but it's also can take in turtles that um, they don't have as much capacity as OTCC, but they they do a lot of good work with turtles. Uh, and there's also uh, the Turtles Kingston group uh, in Kingston that helps coordinate uh, taxiing turtles um, out to some of these places. So they're, they're a great resource for injured turtles too. Okay, well, I've got it on, um, I've got it on uh, uh, the video to go to the person who's speaking. So um, perhaps anybody who would like to ask a question, you can go ahead. Linda, did you have a question? I, I did indeed. I wasn't sure I, I uh, indicated by raising my hand on the icon, but I just wanted to ask Matt whether there's a screening that's over top of the, um, uh, the nest wow. boxes that you um, build to prevent the predators from hopping over the top and into the, um, the egg mass. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there, there is like a, a metal mesh screening that goes over the box. Okay. Um, that's, uh, I forget the exact diameter, but it's pretty small. Um, so animals can't dig into it, but okay. big enough to that allows sunlight to reach in because uh, temperature is so important for the egg. So yeah, it needs to be small enough to, to block the predators, but big enough to, to keep the heat in and yeah they're uh i couldn't bikes. see it on the picture so i was just yeah. curious about that. okay thank you yeah thanks i just wanted to make one other comment on my uh, the weather network there was a little um um short about turtles as well so i don't know whether that was just a coincidence or 
Uh, I don't know whether anybody else saw it or not, but on my my weather network, um, it showed you know how usually they have the uh, storms and everything else that's going on in in the uh, in the area. But this was a a, a very good presentation. Basically, imitated the or the same one that you did. So that was uh, quite a coincidence, anyway. So anyway, but thanks very much. This was very informative. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, I haven't seen that one, but I'll I'll check it out. But yeah, it's. It's very topical with the, the time of the year turtles have emerged and they're they're looking to find nesting sites and travel around now. So um, you have to check that out. What do you think of um, helping turtles with a shovel? Um, depend, it depends how you're helping them. Um, <laughs> like <laughs> Some people use shovel for for not so good things with uh, reptiles and amphibians, but um, they can be. I don't know. It's it can be helpful. Something like the the person who commented, Yvonne said, like with the stick, if you kind of push them along, um, if you're not harming them and you're able to get them across the road, it's usually positive. Because um, if they die, then it's it's <laughs> it's really all all for nothing. So yeah, I'd say if it's uh, it's not harming them, it's done respectfully. If you're just moving them along, then yeah, it's, it could probably help. I always think of snakes and shovels, so that's, that's why it's usually yeah. not good. <laughs> um, is there any uh, tagging of the hatchlings being done at all? To see how much of the uh, success rate there is? Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, We've talked about it. We've we keep an eye on the wetlands where they're released, but we don't have any any tagging yet done. Um, it's something something we're thinking about of kind of marking the turtles, but uh, they're so small and they grow so fast. It's hard to <laughs> hard to keep those markings. But uh, yes, not right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Matt, maybe you could tell them about um, tagging the deer. That's interesting. Yeah, um, another project at the park is uh, studying deer movement in the Thousand Islands. So deer from Hill Island have uh, GPS collars on them. Uh, I think nine deer now, um, and we're getting live data. I think up to every hour of their movements throughout the island and uh, how they they move into the U.S. They swim across islands and. Uh, yeah, so they, they're they still uh, around Hill Island and as the season progresses, we're expecting them to, to travel further and we'll see how far they go. They they don't need a passport. They just, uh, they go south if they want to. So it's uh, it's an interesting project. Uh, so yeah, if anyone's on Hill Island, keep an, an eye out for those collared deer. Yeah, yeah, we saw one again tonight. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, if you uh, know where a, a turtle has dug a nest, in order to uh, protect the eggs from predators, um, you put a box on it with a with, with some mason's cloth or whatever to protect it. Now, how long do you leave it on? How long do you leave it there so that they're going to be able to get out again when they had? Yeah, yeah. So there are two by two like wooden boxes with that meshing and we you can anchor them down with these these spikes so yeah if you know it's great put the box over and then they actually the ones we design have little exit cutouts um on the bottom of each of the pieces of wood so uh it's great to keep an eye on them but they have an, a way to exit which is important because you might not know exactly when they're going to exit but if you see that uh, nest being laid, then you can expect around 60 to 90 days uh, when it will emerge. And it kind of is different for each turtle species. Uh, and yeah, we have resources. I don't have it with me that is each turtle can take a different uh, time period, but it's around 60 to 90 days that you would leave the box on. Uh, but they do have the opportunity to exit if you if you don't see that as well. But uh, within that time period, you keep an eye on it. And then there is usually a little exit hole if they have emerged uh, in the ground there. Um, so yeah, around that time, 60 to 90 days is, is the average. 
Um, although some turtles like the painted turtle will actually stay underground until the, the following spring, but uh, usually 60 to 90 days. Dump them up. So was it all right? Yeah, on, on, that, on that note, I, uh, we did have some painted turtles lay eggs a few years ago on the island and uh, um, I, I was oh, watching okay. for them to hatch and they didn't. And by Thanksgiving, I, I said, okay, what's going on here? So I dug them up. And they were they were out of their egg shells. They were essentially hatched, but they just hadn't emerged. And of course, we released them in the lake. So what would what would have happened if I had left them there? Yeah, it's, the painted turtles are a really unique turtle. So they are able. Not all of them do it, but a large portion can. They they come out of their shell and then they stay in that nest cavity. Uh, until the following spring. So they're kind of have a super ability where they're able to freeze solid for part of the winter underground. Oh. And then in the spring, they can emerge uh, and can be successful. Not all of them make it, but uh, painted turtles are the most successful at this. Some other turtles try to do it and they're not <laughs> as successful, but yeah, the painteds um, are known to, to stay in there um, and then they emerge uh, in the spring. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. They're special, special turtle for that. They've got this super cooling ability that uh, is, is pretty cool. Oh, and we, re we, we rescued a blanding turtle. He was crossing the road down here yesterday and we helped him across the road. That's great. Yeah. Blandings are about this size. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I was talking to Marnie about one that she had rescued too, but yeah, that's the most endangered one, like I said, but one of my favorites.